Hello everyone and welcome to a new Sega Mega Drive game dev tutorial. In this video we're going to cover how to do palette cycling animation. This was a very common technique back in the 16-bit era to make the game world seem much more alive. You frequently saw game designers use this when they wanted to simulate moving water or fire. It was also used when they wanted to simulate a change of day or a change of time or even if they wanted to do some flashing street signs. This was a very powerful technique which also had the advantage of being very light on the system resources. And when combined with other hardware tricks, you could even produce a pseudo 3D effect. Just before we jump in and start writing the code and doing the graphics, I first want to recommend this lecture by Mark Ferrari. In case you don't know, he is the legendary pixel artist behind games such as Loom and Monkey Island. In this talk, not only does he give advice on how to make the most of few colours and how to use dithering and other techniques to improve your graphics, he also goes into great detail about palette cycling. The subject of the lecture is 8-bit art, and when he says 8-bit, he doesn't mean Master System or NES. 8-bit in this context of course refers to the number of colours you can display on the screen which in this case is 256. And as you're seeing on your screen right now with that many colours you can really produce some amazing effects just using palette cycling alone. Of course if you want to display that many colours on your Mega Drive you're going to have to plop a 32x in there. However even with the 61 colours we have at our disposal under normal circumstances you can still produce some very neat effects on the base console. Towards the end of the talk he also goes into detail about how exactly to construct the graphics so that the uh, palette swapping looks like a smooth animation rather than just flashing pixels. This is a very tricky thing to get right so it's really great to have this advice from a master of the craft. Okay now let's get to work ourselves and we're going to be using the Revenge of Shinobi waterfall background and make sure that the image is set to index rather than RGB. The software program I'm using today is a sprite as usual. The first color in the palette is this black and this is going to be the background color. What we're going to be focusing on are these whites and greens and blues. The advantage of palette cycling is rather than having lots of unique tiles in VRAM that you constantly swap in and out to create the animation, we can simply cycle through the uh, index palettes to create the effect that we want. I will quickly demonstrate that here and if we for example we move this white to the first index then you can see that the water has moved a bit because all the palettes have shifted the colours and if we carry on doing this you can see that eventually we'll have the full cycle of the waterfall. Okay, so I think that's the full cycle complete. And if I simply keep pressing uh, Control Z and Control Y again, we can move it a bit quicker so you can see the waterfall effect a bit more clearly. What we need to do next is to store the changes in palette somehow and then transfer it into SGDK. There are a number of ways we could do this, but for today, I want to keep things very, very simple, both in terms of the graphics as well as the programming I want to stick to the things that we know already how to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a series of very small images just 8 pixels by 8 pixels so a single tile and each of those images are going to have a slightly shifted version of the palette. We're then going to upload these into um, SGDK and we're going to use that to take the palette information from. So we'll start off with the default palette and make sure that the color mode is indexed and then you can simply um, save the file as a PNG. With that first one done we're simply going to shift the um, colors one by one and then we're going to save under a different file name each time so in the end we'd have seven different files these very small eight by eight files and then we're going to have different palette information in each one of them. Okay, with that done, now let's take a look at our SGDK file. So I've already got here the all the um, images we just created already loaded onto our cartridge. And you can also see the Shinobi waterfall background there too. As usual for Patreon supporters, I will supply the full source code for this lesson, but for everyone else, just take a look at our starting off point here. 
And today is very simple. We're basically just loading a regular background image onto the screen and that's it. So I think this is pretty much what we did on the first ever lesson on Mega Drive Game Dev. And this is the result of the ROM on our screen. And at the moment it's just a still waterfall, but of course we're going to change that now. As I said earlier in the video, I want to keep it very simple today. So let's start off with creating a timer. So it's going to be an integer timer equals zero. And because we might may have many different timers in our game, let's be a bit more specific and call this the palette timer. And as usual, just define this before int main. As is usual with these timers, we're going to want to iterate it within our game loop. So where it says while, well, simply write um, palette timer plus plus, which is of course the equivalent of writing palette timer plus equals one, which would add one to it each time. So the palette timer is going to start up at zero, then go to one, then two, then three, then four, and so on. And of course, to capture this um, time, to make something happen at certain times, we want to create some if statements. So we're going to do if open brackets palette timer is equal to, and we can write a number here. And it's within these if statements that we're going to change the actual palette. So let's make it equal to zero. And what we're going to do is we're going to simply use the um, our usual pal set palette function that we really use just when we set up the background in the first place. But instead of taking the uh, data from the background itself, we're going to take the data from those little images we created with the different, slightly different, slightly cycled palettes. So this first one, let's take the palette data from uh, this file here, the PC0. And where it says BG1, since you change that to PC0. So it'll take the image data from that little file rather than from our background. Next up, we can pretty much copy and paste the code, but make it else if instead of just an if statement. And you're gonna have to decide how often you want the palette to change. So that'll determine by how what you set the um, palette timer equal to. So let's do it every maybe 10 frames. So that's one sixth of a second. It'll, the palette's going to change. So keep it at PAL0 and simply change it to PC1 instead of PC0. And then simply do more copy and pasting and iterate the palette timer each time. And also don't forget to change which file is taking the palette data from. So it's going to start off taking it from um, PC0, then PC1, PC2, PC3, 4, 5, and then finally 6. If I recall correctly, I think the uh, number 671 was returning our cycle to its default position. So to be honest, we probably could have just um, used the uh, background we already have rather than creating this extra file. But uh, never mind, it keeps things maybe more neat and clean this way. We're almost finished now, but first of all, we have to do one more thing because at the moment our palette timer, it keeps going up and up by one each single cycle. So once it gets past 60, it's going to keep going up and up. And since we chose an int, an integer, it means it's going to be a 32-bit number. So that's going to go up to a very high number before it returns back to zero again. So instead, what we want to do, we want to manually set it. So at a certain time, it's going to change back to zero again so that the whole cycle will return back to the beginning and it will start over again. So once the timer gets to 70, the obvious thing will be to return it back to zero. Remember, we use a single equal sign this time to assign it a new number rather than the double equal sign, which is used for comparisons. However, bear in mind that at the end of these if and else if statements, that's when we iterate, that's when we add one to the timer. So if we make it zero at that point, it's again going to add one to it, which will make it one. And if we do that, remember the first one, it says if palette time equals zero. So if we do it this way, it's going to skip past that first one. So what we want to do instead is make it to equal to minus one. Then the palette time is going to add one. So it's going to be equal for zero for the next cycle. So that will take effect. In fact, while we're up here, why don't we change this from an integer, which is a 32 bit number, which is a bit of overkill. So we can try like an eight bit number. U8 remember be zero to two five five, but we need a negative number. So X S8 will be roughly minus one two eight to one two eight. So that could be okay for our purposes here, but I often find that it's best to do it as a 16 bit number. So if we do it S16, that's a sign 16 bit number. So it can be a minus or a positive value in the many thousands. So I think it's safe to keep it as a 16 bit number for now. That will be more flexible in case in the future we want to make the number go above one two eight. I may have the math slightly wrong here, but I think maybe if we make it 69 instead of equal to 70, that will result in a more even uh, transfer from cycle to cycle, but I'm not sure. Maybe I should have left it at 70. Okay, now let's save, compile, and open up the ROM. 
Well, I'm not 100% sure that I managed to rip the original graphics as same as they appeared in Revenge of Shinobi. I think the effect is very, very close and you can see it definitely looks like a waterfall and it looked very nice if we put the you know foreground and the sprites in front of it. And of course, by changing the uh, numbers we just created, you can also change the speed in which the palette changes and make it either look faster or slower. But I think this pace looks quite nice. Of course having all this code within the while loop looks a bit messy so let's create a little function where we can put all our code in. And we do this the same as usual by writing a function prototype at the very top just before main and then in the bottom we're going to uh, paste that and we're, within the brackets we're going to put all the code and then we're going to call that code within the main while loop. Since I've covered how to do this in previous lessons, I'm going to fast forward for it so feel free to slow it down or pause if you want to see the process in more detail. Before I go, I want to show you a quick trick you can do in a sprite just so you can get a preview of what it should look like on the console without having to go through all the hassle of actually programming it. For this example, let's take another Shinobi waterfall, this time from the Genghis GG Shinobi. Again, we have an index image and this time it's going to be the final four colors, which are the water colors, which are going to cycle through. Unfortunately, at the time of making this video, a sprite doesn't have any kind of function where you can quickly preview a color cycle. Fortunately, what it does allow you to do is to create your own scripts, which are basically little pieces of code, which you can then use to add functionality to a sprite. I've been playing about with writing different scripts recently, and I'll include those in a upcoming lesson. But fortunately, in this case, for color cycling, someone's already gone to the trouble of writing a script for us, so we can just use this one. I will leave a link in the video description where you can go to this page and also to their GitHub page. You can see that I've written a number of different little scripts, but the one we want to use is the color cycle one. To download these, simply go to the top where it says code, click on this and download zip. The download should only take a second or two and then you can unzip the file. Back in ASPRAT, go to file and then scripts and then do the open scripts folder. This is where ASPRAT stores all your scripts and you can see I've got quite a few in here because I've been working on quite a lot recently. What you're going to want to do is go to that um, unzip folder you just downloaded and search for the color cycle one and simply copy that over into this folder. I've already done this and you can see at the very top here the color cycle 005. Once this is done you can close that little window and you can go up to file again, go to scripts and select rescan scripts folder. With that done, this script should be now be ready to use. So go to file again, go to scripts yet again, and simply choose the color cycle 005 from your list of scripts. Now what we want to write here is the frames you want to cycle and what order we want to cycle them. So remember this has to be the index number. So we have to count from the left. So the first color is zero, and then we have to go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can see that the first one we want to start cycling is the number seven. So we're gonna to wanna to cycle um, the indexes, color indexes 7, 8, 9 and 10. Make sure you click the little box that says add frames and then simply press start the riot. You'll notice at the very bottom there's added three frames of animation so if you go down to the bottom and click the play button it'll play through all those frames of animation and you can now see that what our waterfall looks like when we have the palette cycling in place. If it's nothing's happening here, then you probably put the file color mode to RGB rather than index. So make sure you set it to index and then repeat the process again. And if you want to change the speed of the animation, that's very easy to do. Simply highlight all of the frames you want to change the speed of. And then you can right click properties and you can change how fast the, um, the animation moves from frame to frame. At the moment, the script doesn't include any kind of function where it can simply uh, create automatically all these different uh, images for you with the different palette cycles it might be a good idea maybe at some point in the future i'll do that myself if i do manage to do it in the future then check the video description because so i'll provide an update there maybe i'll provide my own scripts that you can download and just so it can automate the process that we went through before which was a bit a bit finicky a bit boring to go through so if i can take this script here maybe change it a bit maybe have it so that a sprite can create all these little files automatically that would be a really good little script to have but for now this is just for demonstration purposes and of course it's a lot better to be able to just experiment with things in ASPRAT rather than having to keep going back to the code and changing the code to see how it looks so a big big thank you to the creator of this script okay so that's it for this tutorial thanks so much for watching if you're interested in this kind of content then don't forget to subscribe to the channel I'm interested in this and if you wish to support the channel further and want to get extra things for example the code for each lesson then i have a patron and any support is much appreciated you won't go unrewarded until next time farewell